I ask you again, are we a Soviet economy? Are we a capitalist economy? Are we a confused medieval economy? I think we are a confused medi- medieval economy because we also like darbars. Every day there's a picture of, Prime Minister took a meeting. That's a headline. My God, never heard of that. I never heard of that anywhere in the world except here. Prime Minister took a meeting. Prime Minister noticed something. Hello, okay, fine. So, part of the Soviet economy is we don't want to open up the economy. And this is where I think, unfortunately, my the IMF also played a role. Look at the trade gap, and it's increasing now. Why? We've done two things. One is since 2008, we cleaned out our tax, sorry, our tariff system to 2005. Manzoor Sahib is sitting here. He can tell you chapter and verse on that. What did we do? 2008 IMF program, we reversed it. We put in regulatory duties, additional custom duties. Since then, regulatory duties, additional custom duties have been increasing. And what have we been doing? We've been fiddling with the exchange rate. Market determined exchange rate we don't want. So we raise tariffs. This is economics 101. You can raise tariffs to prevent the exchange rate from rising. Okay, fair enough. Exchange rate rising is uncomfortable for all of us. I agree. I'm not. But there are certain economic laws that have to be observed. And here it is. You can see the trend of imports is going up much faster than the trend for exports. Okay. Now what's happening? Contrary to what you might think, we disincentivize exports. We incentivize imports. Since day one, we've had an import substitution policy. This is another criticism that Pide makes. We are sitting in the past. The Huck Hag model, Mavula and Harvard Advisory Group model, which was based on import substitution, borrowing money, and closing the economy. That model is still valid. We close the economy. We want to do import substitution. We want to make cars. We don't make cars. We buy Lego kits and we assemble cars. Now we're doing the same thing for mobile phones. Think about it. We had people, textile owners, who were exporting. What we did? What did we do? We privatized and told them, you take cement and you take banking. What did they do? They stopped exporting. They looked inwards. Then we told them, you make cars. Before that, we told them, you come into IPPs. Everything is imports, import substitution. Nothing is exporting. With results in all the big houses, we've done a study in, 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 in Pied, all the big houses are not exporting. Well, 80-90% of them are not exporting. At the same time, they're very small pygmy firms. We need our firms to grow. We need them to be exporters. So we must make export a national priority. And imports, even the World Bank has a study on this, imports are important to exports. And all the exports, if you talk to them, will tell you we need imports. And that's where the refund problem comes in too. So we need to liberalize our import policy. Import substitution, look at this. We were supposed to localize and indigenize all those things. We make all the car parts here. First of all, it's such a stupid policy. If you go to to any website and check, all the cars are made in a hundred different countries. All the, sorry, car parts, they're assembled in one place. A long time ago, there was an article called I Pencil. I urge you all to read that. There's also videos on that. A pencil, which is a very small thing, which has a few parts, that is made in 50 countries. Parts are always made in different countries. Here we wanted to make all the parts and look at what's happening. All the, the intermediate inputs, instead of going down according to this policy, have gone up. So we have lost out a bad policy, badly thought out, and we did that. Okay. Now here it is, tariff rationalization. Look at our tariffs. They've been going all over the place. Custom revenue tariff, we've got that. Our tariff policies, additional custom duties, regulatory duties, we are simply proposing. Get rid of those, rationalize our tariff policy. Okay, maybe it takes three to five years or whatever, but we must open out our economy and bring our tariffs down to regionally competitive levels. Our tariffs are absurd right now. They're hurting the country. They're hurting the country very badly. And we must bring them down. In the, at the beginning, we can go a little slow, but we can figure it out. And we figured it out. I don't want to go into details. We need four or five slabs, maybe even lower than that over time. But let's think about it. This is the most important thing. We must give a very clear signal to the market. We are liberalizing. First step, get rid of the additional, uh, the ACD and the RD. 
and rationalize with some other. Then we have also the GST on tariffs. So we are closing the economy again and again. And all this thing about luxury or non-luxury goods is a disaster. And we might also think about, although I'm not sure, we need large trading houses that can handle exports. How do we handle them? Not that the government should make it. TCP should go. Not government houses. Let people, people develop these trading houses. We can give some tax incentives or something. We can make that happen. Key decisions, we need to remove additional custom duty. SROs. The SRO, the exemptions that have been given everywhere. FPR is an estimate. The exemptions are worth over 2 trillion rupees. Those exemptions have to go. It will also help the tariffs. It will also help open out the economy, remove tariff cascading, export subsidies, etc. Stop them. Let people export and give them a tax incentive on the basis of their whole total exports, not just a small amount. And then we must also allow corporate, corporates, large corporates to become exporting houses. Can we do that? That's up to you guys. Go ahead, Jim. Anybody? Dr. Sahib, he said everything. Like just two, three points. I'll give you an example. Our tariffs are high. Now, China has done FTA. China has given all the concessions. We have given our tariffs to their imports. So, we can do one thing. That what we have given to China, we can give them all the concessions so that their subsidy is over. That's what they have given us for us. ये एक एक बेसिक पॉइंट है दूसरा ये है कि वो पहले पार्ट में हम डिस्कस नहीं किया कि सारी दुनिया जो है वो डायरेक्ट टैक्सेस का रेशो ज्यादा होता है क्योंकि ये जो गरीबों पे इन डायरेक्ट टैक्सेस का बहुत इंपैक्ट पड़ता है अगर वो घी पे टैक्स देते हैं या किसी भी चीज पे तो वो ज्यादा पड़ता है पाकिस्तान में ये उल्टा सिस्टम है अभी तक हमारा सिक्सटी टू सेवेंटी परसेंट इन डायरेक्ट टैक्सेज है और 30 टू 40 परसेंट डायरेक्ट टैक्स है इट शुड इट शुड बी एक्सेक्टली द अदर वे राउंड और बाकी आई आई मीन आई डोंट लाइक टू गो ऑन लेकिन कोल बी इंडस्ट्री देख लें तो उसका हमने ये जस्ट जस्ट एग्जांपल दी थी उन्होंने इसकी ऑटो इंडस्ट्री की अभी अभी देखते ये 2002 में हमारी और इंडोनेशिया की एक ही गा� प्रोडक्शन थी दो दो लाख के करीब दो ढाई लाख के करीब इंडोनेशिया ने अपनी वो जिस तरह के कहीं से अच्छे पार्ट मिलते हैं लगाने हम लोकलाइजेशन पे लगे रहे तो इंडोनेशिया अब जो है तकरीबन कोई एक मिलियन गाड़ियां बनाता है कुछ चार बिलियन की एक्सपोर्ट करता है इंक्लूडिंग टू ऑस्ट्रेलिया डेवलप कंट्रीज वगैरह और हम जो है वो वो उसी पॉलिसी को और वो वो फेल पॉलिसी को हमने मोबाइल पे जिस तरह डॉक्टर साहब ने कहा मोबाइल पे लगा दी मोबाइल की हमने वो कीमत डबल ट्रिपल कर दी और कंज्यूमर बेचारे को को मार दिया टू बेनिफिट ए फ्यू एसेंबलर्स थैंक यू थैंक यू जी वंडरफुल डिस्कशन आई वांट टू ऐड के हमने जब इनके साथ एग्रीमेंट भी किए हैं तो वी डोंट अब्जॉर्ब एनी स्टैंडर्ड वी हैव क्रिएटेड लोकल पाकिस्तानी स्टैंडर्ड्स इवन इफ दी टोटा टोटा ब्रांड इस फैक्ट्री में पाकिस्तान वी कांट एक्सपोर्ट इट टू योर पर मार्केट बिकॉज़ वी हैव नॉट अडॉप्टेड दो स्टैंडर्ड्स so if uh, we uh, uh, make them uh, to uh, prepare or uh, manufacture or uh, assemble cars here in our, uh, any uh, international standard, which may be American or European or Japanese standard, we will be able to export those uh, 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 things manufactured here. Uh, the focus uh, should be on the uh, standardization of goods. Uh, similarly, if you uh, can see uh, in certain country, the simple switch of this uh, uh, any gadget is uh, three pin, whether it is uh, a square side or a round side, uh, 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 it is the same all over. Whereas here uh, we go in the market, we uh, find every type of switches, uh, all type of pins, and uh, we are holding uh, many type of uh, adopters with them, uh, which uh, you, uh, can be used in one switch and cannot be used in the other. So for those uh, uh, focusing on uh, our export, we should be also uh, going for the uh, quality and the standards as well. Thank you. Sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, online, please. Okay. So go ahead. Can you hear me? I agree with you on um, uh, what you just said about whether we have to decide whether we are a medieval economy or you know whatever type of economy we have. So using Fukuyama's vocabulary on you know state versus scope, uh, sorry, scope versus um, strength of the state. So I think my question would be, how do we see on the spectrum where is, first, how do we define the strength of the state? 
and then if we are talking about you know we, because liberalization is at best the question of you know deciding what scope we are going to have for the state so firstly what kind of strength are we looking at and you know i i hear this a lot about these circles where we are glamorizing the liberalization of the 90s but uh, we oh, we need to put that into context because they, that came about as uh, the result of sap's the structural adjustment programs and we don't have very good memories of that or you know in retrospect i don't think that's a great choice so if we are looking at liberalization and we're deciding on what we think is the scope of the state then um uh, how are we going to uh, combat the, the the negative externalities which we know when the state size reduced or went back or we wanted to uh, reduce uh, the, the, you know i don't know the role of the state it kind of resulted into the state trying to protect itself and and drawing funding from let's say the essentials like health education and and something that would build the nation and going into uh, more funding for let's say the military or the law enforcement agency so if we are now again talking about liberalization how are we going to not mis- make the mistakes of the past omayy shami from pakistan economic forum i am talking that uh, i'm saying that uh, when we are talking about more saving at the at one time we want to encourage it otherwise uh, in this scenario it is justified to put 15 to 30% tax on the banking uh, profit you know so because uh, discouraging the people to uh, put their money in in banks it means that they will buy either the property files or they will invest in the dollars you know so this is my question then thank you thank you very much two quick questions what is your view at pied regarding ftas of pakistan engaging more in free trade agreements um number one number two um dr dr nadim you 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 said that the 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 sovietization of the economy in pakistan i mean sorry but in, in in my humble understanding this has a lot to do with a political structure how can you question how can you incentivize political decision makers to be more free market oriented and and accept more i say market based solutions to the system you had um you had uh, raised during the initial stages of your presentation thank you very much back to you thank you anyone else G- please unko de dr nadim you said that when you were talking about liberalization size of the government and uh, custom duties uh, you said cutting the size of the government and then someone also talked about uh, recently pakistan economic forum that banking is doing such a wonderful job so now there has to be some sequencing some prioritization we have problem of resources and we should ask ourselves that where should can we start now the difference between the government revenue and expenditure as percentage of gdp is around 8% and most of that is because of the uh, borrowing which government has done from the bank and banks have recently made in the last fiscal year they have made a profit of more than half a trillion on the investment they have done in the pibs and tbls and other government securities so it's a comment that the starting point is to cut the size of the government only then you can think of freeing up the resources and thinking about putting that surplus or saved into other uh, uh, fruitful ventures thank you uh, one more online question shahid kardar sir please very quickly i think two things uh, that i wanted to say was partly been dealt with by uh, mandur sahab another point that someone made regarding the quality of the products that you produce simply because of import liberalization uh, uh, sorry uh, import protection uh, so the, the only thing i want to add uh, to those two is two points one the first the first one that i want to add is and look um, even in the case of as nadi mentioned in the case of exporters who i mean i mean businesses whose core competence was exports so they were doing that for the last 50 odd year we turned them into rentiers and he was referring to uh, them uh, to the fact that they have now been part of the banking business they have been into ipp they are now you know producing car none of them of course are matchable uh, in terms of quality globally so that's the first point the second one is someone just raised the question and both of it about how do you change or get government to think differently and to think in terms of opening up 
the FTA part has already been dealt with by uh, Mansoor sir. Opening up, really, I think part of the problem is that if we reduce the incentive for people to be part of the public sector, the only way that we can reduce that incentive for people wanting to be in government or wanting to be public representatives is to get government out of most of the things. And hence, once you get them out of the system, you will discover that the incentive to perform by the rest of the economy will always be there. And there won't be people who create blockages and constraints and ways of making money for themselves. So we need to reduce that incentive to be part of government, to be part, part of the public sector, and to be part of a public executive framework where there are goodies to be taken and freebies to be had. Okay, thank you. Uh, one last comment from Kakar Saab at the back, member social sector. Ji, uh, thank you. I think many valid points have already been made. Uh, I would like to just highlight one important elephant in the room that I think is uh, probably uh, missing or has not been discussed adequately. And that is, what are the political incentives for elites to undertake the kind of reforms that have been proposed? I mean, economic reforms do not take place in a political vacuum. Every reform by, de by design creates winners and losers. And in particular, uh, in Pakistan, where uh, over the past few decades, we have seen that the time horizon of the elites has progressively decreased. So with such incredibly short time horizons, uh, the highest office in this country is the uh, post of the chief executive, that is the prime minister. If the highest chief executive is not sure of the certainty of his or her tenure, that uncertainty and that short time or, uh, horizon translates uh, and influences policy making as well as implementation all the way to the uh, lower tiers. So how do we factor in that in these reforms, especially given that they will have economic as well as political cost? Okay. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh before we start, I would like to quickly respond to Alberto's question on FTAs. Actually, Dr. Manzoor have also pointed this out, that we need to really think through that how we are engaging in uh, FTAs. And we have to adopt the best practices like Chinese case, where actually they have offered the same kind of concessions to everybody rather than doing it on country on country basis. Second, on the part of how the political decision making can be actually improved towards this kind of reform-oriented thinking or market-based, we have produced a complete report on the manifestos, which actually talks about that what are the actual economic issues and how actually the politicians should take it up. So uh, many things have actually been addressed, but unfortunately, given the time space, we have not talked about here. Next. Two or three things that I'll raise very quickly. One is about the... Uh, somebody sent me this thing just now, which fits in very nicely. Somebody sent me a message saying this is a new liberal agenda. Absolutely it is. Absolutely it is. So please tell me, what is your alternative? You know, these people who hide behind labels need to tell me, okay, you want socialism? Let's do socialism. Right now we've got neither neoliberalism nor socialism. We've got colonialism. Do you want colonialism? Come out and tell us. We'll stay with colonialism. Bureaucracy this, bureaucracy living in a house this, that, etc. State, colonialism, etc. Et fair enough. Do you want markets or not? That's what you're going to come to next. The second thing is Rafi Saab said just now, um, KD, uh, about the prime minister not being there, whatever, whatever. Look, policy continuity is very important. Rafi Saab, despite all the government, you've had wonderful policy continuity. Correct me if I'm wrong. Correct me if I'm wrong. We've had great policy continuity. Has anybody touched the Islamic agenda? It's perfectly there, beautifully there. Try and change it. You can't change it for a second. The Islamic agenda is very much there. Even the judges rule no more interest rate. And nobody can rule against the other paraphernalia that I can't talk about. Much more so than even the military. I can talk about the military, but I can't talk about that. Why? People want it. So what you are saying is if people want it, we educate the people, then policy continuity will come. Of course, another policy agenda that has remained absolutely stable 
despite the politicians, etc. It's the colonial agenda. Nobody checked the colonial agenda. <laughs> Lost everything. So let's be very clear. Policy continuity remains with ideas, not with people. That's the thing. So let's go to markets very quickly, our last agenda. This is where you can again come in and call us neoliberal. Yes, we are. We want markets in this country. Right now, we have no markets. Every market is controlled by the colonial bureaucracy. You know all the prices. They go and check every price every day and rattle their things. The other day, there was on Twitter, one guy had put up that I had a price below the DC rate. And I was pulverized for that. He was chillant for that. So look, guys, prices are fixed by them. By them. Decisions are taken by them. Everybody everybody on TV says decisions are taken. What decisions need to be taken? I lived for 40 years in the US. I lived for five years in England. There were no decisions to be taken. The prime minister, the cabinet is never seen on television. They never take a decision. Okay, that's neoliberal. Let's go to Putin. But this bureaucratic agenda that we've got, hey, everything is going to be done with the bureaucracy. I find that very hard to imagine. What are markets? Markets are nothing but a competitive system. Cricket is a market. Football is a market. Tennis is a market. There are rules and you play, somebody the winner. That's all a market is. The rules are clear and who's playing is clear. Information on the players is clear. That's all. That's all a market is. That's all we want. Markets. Fair enough. If you want to go the other route, let's develop socialism. But this colonialism that we've got, I find it very strange. I'll leave it there. Energy market. Energy crisis, a never-ending crisis. It's merely a theft issue. It's basically a management issue, and it is because of the centralized decision-making. Circular debt, it is rising. Why? We are, what we are doing, we are increasing tariff, and we are increasing tariff, circular debt goes up. And when circular debt goes up, we again increase prices. So it's a cycle going on and on. The result is deceivables are increasing nonstop. So decisions, what has to be done? We what we need is an independent, empowered power commission comprising only of technocrats under the supervision uh, supervision of parliament or its assigned committee. Decentralization made discos or NTDC or any other energy company accountable for their decisions, whether they are administrative decisions, managerial decisions, or the financial decisions. Discos responsible. Uh, okay. And one more thing which needs to be done to, for the better administration is to unbundle discos horizontally and vertically. It's traditionally it's a monopoly, but through a vertical uh, unbundling of a vertical division, it is possible to have some sort of competition through the in the retail sector. What else? We need an independent regulatory authority with no political interference. Complete moratorium on IPPs, new capacity under CTBCM. CTBCM is approved by NAPRA and is waiting for implementation for the last three, four years. So finally, we must have to implement CTBCM and all new uh, additions. Must be, through the, uh, must be under the CTBCM. Energy transition, yes, we need energy transition, but only through net metering and off-grid solutions, not in the any more additions in the national grid. We need a new tariff design, revised uniform tariff policy. Without revising the tariff policy, it is not possible to handle this energy crisis. Tariff must be based on the actual cost of services for all consumer categories, no swaps, flat linear tariff, no tariff-based subsidy or any cross-subsidy. Okay. What else? We need a very simple tariff. Um, an electricity bill should be simplified with no uh, more taxation. It should not be used as an FBR agent. No cross-subsidy or revenue-based load shedding, but load management planning. Okay. In the gas sector, Gas yes, sector again, circular debt has emerged and it is rising in, uh, in comparison to the uh, power sector. Deregulate gas sector, market-based pricing, no subsidy or cross-subsidy. Gas allocation based on, not on the political decision, but on the economic valuation. Single regulator for all the upstream, midstream, and downstream activities with legal and explicit legal and regulatory powers, no political interference. Unbundle gas companies, again, multi-seller distribution model to ensure competition. Currently, they are getting a fixed return based on their uh, return on assets, based on their um, TNT assets. So this formula must be abolished. 
adopt they, these companies, these two uh, distribution and transmission companies, that's in GPL and SSGCL, they must have a business model. And in the energy impo LNG imports, third party access must be allowed. Well, the second market that uh, PIDE is focusing on is the real estate market. Uh, again, uh, around the world, if you look at the real estate market, that gives you a good indication of what is happening in the economy, but not in case of Pakistan. Um, because we believe that uh, in Pakistan, we don't have a working efficient real estate market. Our market has been heavily controlled by uh, the bureaucrats through FBR valuation, through DC rates. And in some areas, there, there are some regulations, but they are not implemented. For example, the real estate agent market, uh, they are not regulated. So they wield uh, a strong power. And most importantly, another example is the file trading. File trading is the predominant transactional modern real estate market. And uh, there is no one regula regulating them. Although there are some laws, if you ask the SECP, is the file trading a security or not? They say, no, it is not. Under our preview, we can regulate it. If you ask CDA uh, why you are not regulating uh, file trading, uh, then they have their own excuses. So the market is not uh, functioning, it is fragmented. And uh, they, because of this fragmentation and uh, heavily uh, bureaucratic control, we are losing huge revenue potential as well, besides the development of real estate market and contributing to the GDP. Uh, with you, Apology Mukaram Sahib, I asked uh, the FBR agent about why you are using uh, FBR valuation and they are, because it is not reflecting the actual transaction price. Uh, his response was that, uh, no, the, after the upgrade, updation, we have the actual market value. So we, we performed the exercise on, based on the Raval Pindi data on zumi.com's asked price. So here is the difference. This is the last week's our estimations, the FBR valuation is 65% less than transaction price. I'm not saying asking price. It's less than transaction price. And if you ask these regulatory bodies, uh, FBR and DC rate, they will tell you that we are regulating prices because we want to maximize the revenue. So here is the example. You are actually losing the revenue because of this regulation instead of maximizing the revenue. But there, there is an alternate. Alternative, what, what White is proposing is that uh, the real issue is that how to disclose the market price or transaction price. There are different mechanisms. One of them is the multiple listing auction model, which we are proposing is that. That, for example, at the pilot, you can start it at Islamabad. Uh, ask a third party to develop a platform, online platform, where a bidding can happen. For example, if I am purchasing a property, it must be compulsory for me to list that property for one week or two weeks on that platform and anyone around the country can bid. If someone can outbid me, he will win the contract and then a certificate will be issued against that person who win the bid. And that will give you the actual transaction price. And the mutation will not happen unless someone or the two parties produce that uh, certificate from that platform. So this is, this is one potential way. Uh, to resolve this price control mechanism. So what we are proposing in the real estate market is that first of all, we need to abolish this DC rate and FPR valuation rate. We need to move towards technology-based solutions. One of them is multiple listing. And file trading, we also have to control it. We have to regulate it. What we are proposing is that SCCP should trade file trading as the securities. It should fall under the definition of security. and. Uh, Regulator regulations must be separated from the development businesses. Either declare capital development authority as a development developer or a regulator. If CDA is a developer, then we need another RIRA regulatory uh, re, uh, agency who regulate the real estate market. And we also need to organize the brokerage industry. And Pied has done a lot of work. And behind these uh, suggestions, we have. A complete working models, which is available on our website, then we also need to uh, update our rental values. The one most important thing which I am not touching up upon is the zoning rules. I think Dr. Nadim will talk about it when he will talk about uh, uh, brands. Uh, so we also need to redefine our zoning. Actually, this is because of our zoning rules, we are facing this urban sprawl and this climate 
uh, change and uh, air quality issues because of this zoning rules we also need to rethink our zoning rules instead of going uh, horizontally we need to go vertically our uh, cities so with this i would request dr nadeem talk about stock market you've already seen two big myths every day i watch tv i have the, i hear this thing from all the tv anchors who mashallah know every subject they know everything under the sun uh that the few economic numbers and they say you know the trend is in 9.85566 past numbers and then you think that you know all economics they keep talking about real estate being the parking place for all black money there's no evidence for it so why is there black money there if the government is going to give you dc rate what the hell are you going to do why does the government give you a dc rate fbr rate nowhere in the world does it happen not even in soviet union not even in russia so i go back to this do we want a dc a soviet union let's make up our minds why does why is real estate still not organized why do we have plots everywhere why because the bureaucracy doesn't want you to build in the middle of the city because they got the houses there so you got this strange mechanism of medieval control going on the king's castle is here so you can't ne- build next to the king's castle simple that's what used to happen in the medieval era we still got it going on because you guys want colonialism not soviet union not socialism not this thing energy you seen energy is a governance mess energy is not as as these anchors say energy is not chori we shown you the figures energy is not chori energy is mal administration chori is a small part just yes, chori but to put everything in chori as you seen in lahore that they are billing people like myself extra they are billing the factories extra to cover up their chori chori does not happen please remember one thing chori cannot happen anywhere without the connivance of the colonial state so let's take take that dictum and run with it now we don't have capitalism again why because our stock market is a disaster we've done this estimate that our stock market is dominated by the government can you imagine the largest company is ogdc which is a government owned company can you imagine the second second largest company is british american tobacco which is ptc ptc is the largest can you imagine tobacco company is the largest company in the stock market our domestic companies are pygmies tiny india tata is 362 billion dollars more than the gdp of pakistan engro is not even 1.5 billion dollars why because you don't let those companies grow running off the tax for license for this that so that they can't grow so they don't make any big investment they don't do anything several government entities are running the system multinational sector we force them to come in now they're delisting stock market has come down from 20% of gdp in 1990s to now 7% of gdp it's declining nobody wants to list on a stock market and nit which is an ayurveda thing a khag model thing nit which is supposed to be government control which is still government control which behaves in favor of the states is still there why can't we privatize it so it's a very strange market corporate governance we've looked at the boards of the big companies they're all small clubs i jokingly say they're only members of sindh and punjab club in fact we've got a pakistan institute of corporate governance that ensures that none of you can be on the boards is anybody here who has been a board member is a board member now board of the governors of any company board of directors see you can't have members of civil society on the board of directors it has to be the sindh club punjab club members why do we have that why can't we allow board directors i have asked this question of many of the most eminent people in the country and they're not on boards why because we made this a closed club again a soviet activity look at the exporting firms top firms in the country almost export nothing why how are we going to fill our current account gap if they're not exporting anything we can go ahead and fiddle around do anything but these guys are not exporting why they're not exporting i can give you names of people the big companies they export nothing and yet they are sitting at the table in the ministry of finance they are all members of this this organization that 
Chamber of Commerce, this, etc. They're all sitting with the Minister of Finance. And they're all going to advise the government. Not exporting, but advising the government. This is what we get when we are Soviet Union. We've looked at 1% increase in the stock market, increases your GDP, increases everything. Even in Pakistan, we've looked at that. What are the decisions? We need to get the big companies. Ah, another thing. Can you imagine we don't have a single professionally run country company in this country? Take out the multinationals. Imagine McDonald's and Coca-Cola are sitting out there somewhere. The CEO has never been to Pakistan. Their senior management doesn't come to Pakistan. Yet they're able to extract a profit. They take people like us. We company for them. We send them a profit. We centralize management. Work. Except we don't want it to work here. It works. Modern books tell us decentralized management is the go, way to go. We don't want to cent decentralize anything. Not even energy. So what's happening? Our companies are small, family-run states and their children. And they don't want to list on the stock market. We've done a survey of the engineering sector and the sports court sector, the middle companies all over Pakistan. They tell us they don't want to list. They don't want to grow. Two reasons. One, they say we want to stay below the bureaucracy because they'll kill us if we grow big. They'll come after us. Two, the Soviet Union will come after us. They don't want us to grow. Second, if we list, we might lose our company. So there's no takeover market in this company. Everywhere else in the world, you hear takeover news every day. Why can't we take over? SECP will not allow takeover. But in any case, there's very little stock to take over. 70-80% of the company is family-owned. Only 10 or 20% of the market. Why is more is stock not in the market? So we want to say we need big corporates. We need billion-dollar companies, multi-billion-dollar companies, not one billion. We need 50, 60, 100 billion-dollar companies, but they must be listed on the market professionally run and they must be exporting. For that, we should make it a national priority. It won't happen today, but let's give them a 3-4% break on corporate uh, income tax. If they list and if they export. Those are the kinds of things that we have to talk about, right? Privatization. We do privatization of the stock exchange. I don't know why. Maggie Thatcher, Vaslav Klaus, all the company countries, except Russia, did the stock market, the privatization through the stock market. Why can't we do it, do it through the stock market? Let the market grow. Let people like you benefit from privatization. I remember when I went to Czechoslovakia to liberalize that country from the fund direction, the, the finance minister, famous who became prime minister, Vaslav Klaus said, I'm going to do it through the stock market and I'm going to give every citizen a share. Why do you want to give it to the rich people? But we still do that. Why can't we list uh, discos and everything on the stock market. Why should they go to a SAIT? Why can't we use the stock market to list uh, PIA today? We have 3 or 4% of PIA in the stock market. Why can't we float more in the stock market? And that, I think if we do that, we have a double whammy. Even if we lose some money, A, it'll be transparent. Two, it'll increase the stock market. Three, it'll bring you people into this system and we'll increase our savings. If we do that, there'll be a lot of things happening. Now, another question that I'll turn to is branding. We no brand names in Pakistan. Why don't we have brand names? Our companies still tell me when we go there, they say, hey, I don't want to make a brand. I work for Nike. So I'm going to make a t-shirt, $2 a shirt I'll get. Well, as Nike will take $30 a brand. Brand name has money. And this is something I use everywhere. Anybody knows what this is? What is this? Sorry, iPhone, good. Why am I raising an iPhone? Where is it made? And where is the richest company in the world? So what does that company do? R&D, R&D and branding. What do our companies do? They have no R&D, no branding. Why? Because they're stuck in the past. But branding cannot happen without a complete value chain. Branding cannot happen without, without a vibrant retail market in Pakistan. What have we done to the retail market? We've stifled the retail market. Why? Because the bureaucracy say you can't make a downtown. You have to make plots. So the plots have to go 5,000 miles out of town, or at least 20 miles out of town. 
and you have to drive in the car, that doesn't do it. Brands are built downtown. Brands are built in, in department stores, in chain stores, in shopping malls. We haven't allowed shopping malls until very recently, and that also grudgingly. And we haven't allowed chain stores at all. Remember, we tax car um, um, Alphata, and we give a subsidy to car for. This is our policy. So what happened? We have to flexibilize our owning, zoning uh, laws. We have to allow commerce to happen. We are prioritizing housing and not commerce, which is the wrong way to build a city. Cities were built for commerce. People came there for commerce. Housing, they built their house on top of the shop. Here we want a two-story house. We don't want apartments. We don't want dense urban centers. Forget it. You can't have commerce. You can't have branding. So it's a whole lifestyle change that we have to do. In fact, if you don't densify the city, you can't even save on energy. So those are important things that we have to do. For every 100 million branded exports, you can have three, uh, one to 3% uh, concession in corporate income tax. Why not? Let's give people tax concessions for outcomes, not for inputs. That's what we should do. Well, uh, Dr. Ndeem was in the flow, so I don't want to break it, but he asked me to present banking sector. So again, uh, banking market is also fragmented. Our uh, There is limited diversity. The most credible uh, funds that is available to the banking sector goes to the government securities. They are heavily tied to the government borrowing, and that is crowding out the private sector investment. And here is uh, an empirical evidence of this one. Uh, these figures are decade-wise. If you look at uh, that it, uh, 90s, uh, 80s to 90, uh, the Pakistan 25% uh, credit available goes to the private sector. Over the years, it uh, reduced to 15%. And there is direct connection between uh, the credit to private sector and the economic growth. Uh, this evidence produced by the state bank as well. So it is robust predictor of the economic development. So banking sector is not working. What FIDE is proposing is that we need to develop non-banking financial entities, as well as we also need to uh, lose the entry into the banking sector. Currently, entering into the banking market is uh, difficult. It is uh, almost uh, uh, not possible. As well as we also uh, proposing that we need some mid-sized banking uh, sector as well. Uh, for example, we need to allow regional uh, banking banks uh, to uh, develop, as well as we also need to develop the foreign exchange market without uh, some controls that we put time and often on them. And we also need to uh, extend the primary dealers uh, market as well. No, uh, the last market is the agriculture market. Uh, which is very critical for Pakistan because uh, we still believe that we are agri-based economy. Although Pai says that, no, we are not. So uh, in the sub-market sub, uh, of the agriculture is the seed market, input market, which is again heavily controlled by the bureaucracy. bureaucracy. Uh, the control with one form of the control is the registration. The registration, seed registration, it is a lengthy process. It is time-taking and time-consuming process. And what Pied found that it is not working. Uh, people more uh, rely on the brands instead of labels, uh, labels instead of these certificates. And uh, if you look at the market, there are only 37% of the farmers have the access to quality, high-quality uh, seeds, which translates into that 63% don't have. And we measure the potential loss of because of this low quality uh, seed, it is 1.7 trillion rupees in Pakistan. So we can potentially gain, potential gain of having high quality seeds available in the market to 100% of the farmers will be 1.7 billion rupees. And uh, on, government is also engaged in the commodity operations. Again, what Pride is proposing that government should pull out from this commodity operations. There is no need to buy wheat. And uh, in a phase manner, three years. And uh, next is support price. Uh, here at Pride, we have done that uh, a study. Uh, Dr. Badullah is here. He will talk about it later. In those crops where we are providing support prices, they are actually the farmer is making the losses because they are not diversifying to high value crops. 
it is very uh, uh, interesting knowledge brief that pi has produced the uh, primary objective of the sport pi is to stabilize the prices but which is not yielding the uh, very objective of this intervention and uh, there is the cost of regulations in just in case of wheat we have then different institutions as well in the process of procuring pasco is there food department of punjab is there and the uh, total institutional cost is 973 billion rupees and besides this there is also circular debt growing in this uh, commodity operation especially wheat procurement in case of punjab it is 680 billion rupees so what's our recommendations in the agriculture market is that the first of all we need to discontinue this spot price it will lead the farmers to high value crops it will diversify our crop pattern abolish commodity operation discontinue seed registration and testation and move towards uh, labeling and establish new rules of our truth in labeling and setting up seed company stop seed by seed seed registration uh, clear penalties for those who malpractice and encourage private storage by offering tax incentives for five years on certifications so these are some of our uh, suggestions so uh, this is our last part on the markets where we have covered uh, six markets no the floor is open for discussion if you have any comment suggestion or question please feel free thank you so much uh, dr khalid willis from stpi uh, my uh, a brief comment on uh, energy market uh, maybe uh, in 1930s the great depression that was caused by supply creates its own demand is true for pakistan's energy sector as well where there is ample amount of supply but there is no demand uh, what we need to sort of uh, do our uh in, in this isla agenda uh, maybe we can advocate for uh demand expansion uh, plan as well for pakistan just like the igsap indicative generation uh, capacity expansion plan uh, maybe there should be uh, igsap uh, indicative demand expansion plan as well for pakistan or maybe we can integrate our industrial demand uh, with this uh, energy to, uh, energy ca capacity as well uh what right now in pakistan is uh, the consumption uh, profile is that uh, about 50% comes from residents uh, residential uh, sector and about 20 18 to 20% comes from industry what we are doing is we are uh, making or generating electricity from imported fuel consuming dollars but we are consuming it for unproductive reasons so maybe uh, this can be added to this isla agenda as well thank you ji anybody else please run sir ji thank you very much so on the energy particularly in afia i think this point we made earlier also in econ fest and then again at the world bank meeting um, we are missing the part where we have straight jacketed our thinking in solving the energy problem so i think khal saab ne abhi jo baat we uh, just said is a classic example of the fact that let's create more demand actually i'm going to give you a simile very quickly an anecdote from uh, afghanistan who is our neighbor and it's on wheat and it is related to energy so afghanistan overall grows enough and actually more wheat than it needs but because of the seasonal shift going from badakhshan all the way down to uruzgan what you find is that wheat actually matures uh, down in uruzgan kandhar very close to its early spring whereas Uh, July, August, way up in the north because of the cold weather. Now it's because of the absent absence of this. Ko Urdu me tarsil bolte hain. Good logistics is why Afghanistan is always complaining about wheat shortages, and Pakistan suffers as a result. Now the same thing is true for energy, and I want to challenge everybody in the studies that we have done, including, by the way, the CTBCM, that actually when you look about look at the modern way of consuming energy, which is about community. localized etc forget for a minute the residential versus industrial versus this so bottom line is this long transmission which we have become so addicted to like our central infrastructure whether it be road or whatever and our thinking of localized consumption and you know generation distribution and consumption and 
bill collection has totally left us. So this one bespoke, one brush solution for Pakistan will not work. And in fact, if you, and let me just end with the greatest shock that I had this week. So we were talking about UNFCC and selling carbon points and everything. And what we discovered is that very soon, water energy, hydro energy, hydro energy, wo energy jo hum demo se generate kar rahe, is going to come under huge methane curbs. Because apparently they just found out that when large spillways are built and when large amount of water gushes out, a lot of methane is released. So no longer is hydropower renewable energy. So forget about all the carbon that, you know, cleaning and everything that we are going to do that. So just keep all this in mind and think small, think local. And I think we need to put this discussion about centralized grids versus localized distribution and how to solve the problem. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? We add the friend. Anjum Saab, go there. Um, is it, is it okay if I go first? Ji, please go ahead, then Anjum Saab. Okay. Um, my name is Adil. I'm from the Bad Lab. And I just, I was going through the reform agenda and I saw the word digitalization and automation peppered throughout, but uh, I haven't heard any proper reforms as to what fight would suggest um, should take place better, um, to better support the digitalization process in the country. We've talked about reducing regulations and reducing tax, uh, easing tax reforms. But uh, no real discussion has taken place in regards to what reforms should be taken to better equip the country for a complete digitalization of our governmental and national level system. Thank you. The Anjum sir. Uh, my name is Anju Mehmed. I recently retired from the bank, from the World Bank, and uh, now I'm teaching uh, as a visiting teacher at PIT. Uh, uh, thank you very much for this excellent seminar. I think we have discussed all sectors of the economy and everything is in the slides there. So, uh, for example, I'll just take the energy example which Dr. Afia presented because I come from the energy sector mainly. Uh, the things that Dr. Afia has presented, discos, circular debt and everything, so that needs to be done ASAP. Uh, circular debt, I don't know why can't our policymakers and the IMF see that whenever the tariff goes up, circular mm -hmm. debt goes up. And uh, so can't they see that uh, the uh, tariff has to be rationalized? There have to be a different tariff structure. They have to be prepaid metering. And so many other things can be done by uh, to get more revenue. They just look at the that increase the tariff by 25% and revenue will increase by 25% which is definitely not the case, and we have seen it in the past. Similarly, the discos, the, uh, they were formed back in 98, 99, and 25 years have passed, and the idea was that after the corporatization, they will be uh, uh, unbundled further, vertical and uh, uh, horizontal disintegration, or and then they will be offered for privatization. So privatization started many a times, 99, 2005, 2015, and even a couple of years ago, and it has not gone any forward. But I think now people are sick of the energy sector, and uh, uh, it is time for the government to now take actions. And these studies uh, not necessarily will lead to something. It has to come from the top, a decision maker, Remember, there used to be an office called uh, Chief Controller of Imports and Exports, which had nothing to do with the imports and exports. They were just a signing authority. I imported a car back in 1980, and I had to go to their office three times to get somebody's signature. And it did not mean anything in the whole process. And with one stroke of pen, that office was abolished uh, in early 90s. The uh, foreign currency reforms perhaps did not need a real big study. It all happened overnight. The green channel at the airports was done overnight. So all this can be done, but all the ideas we have discussed today in this seminar 
So I think they need to be sold to the top level people. And some of these ideas can be implemented right away, as long as the top people are with us. If you go uh, with a long study, it will just delay the thing. And one other issue which I have seen in my life is over the past uh, few decades is that we have uh, contracted out our thinking to foreigners or so-called donors. I mean, all the thinking can be done by the people in this room who are sitting here. So why do we need World Bank or IMF or Asian Development Bank and everybody else to think for us? They come, they do the thinking in their own way. They have to get their loans back. So they impose all that conditionality. But if we can think ourselves and we impose that thinking on the government, it can be uh, it can be uh, done. Like all this uh, foreign currency reforms, PTOE, these examples I gave, they were not uh, sold by a donor. They were in-house thinking that came from the government, from somebody, and it was done. Thank you. Thank you very well, sir. Ji, at the back. Ji, I am Dr. Basharat. I am an alternative energy and climate change mitigation and adaptation specialist. My question is that uh, we have 45,000 megawatt. Nobody, I believe, had, has discussed this. We have 45,000 megawatts capacity to generate power. Our requirement in the winter months is just 8,000 megawatts, whereas in summer it is 22,000 megawatts. We pay rest of for the rest of the electricity that, that we can generate for which we have the capacity. We pay capacity payments to IPPs. This is the main reason why we have this circular debt. Circular debt of electricity is 2.8 trillion rupees at the moment. Whereas since they have, the government has introduced LNG-based power plants, our gas circular debt has even crossed the power uh, circular debt. So, FIDE and other research organizations must, must do some research on why we need such a huge capacity, why we have developed such a huge, huge capacity on imported fossil fuel. Most of it is generated through imported fossil fuel. This is uh, just a suggestion. Uh, that's why what we, what we are suggesting is to revise tariff to increase the productive use of energy to make, uh, to maximum, for the maximum utilization of the available gas capacity. Why we have installed sorry, these plants, it is because of the mismanagement and what because of the decentralized decision making. That's why this, we, we, are, we have come up with this much of the capacity and based on fossil fuel capacity. Now, uh, no, actually, uh, you know, uh, there are several departments in the government whose duty is to plan and execute. First of all, it is a planning commission. Planning commission has an energy wing, which has to plan, you know, all these uh, power plants. Then we have NEPRA, which gives generation license as well as the award, awards tariff. We have uh, NTDC, we have CPPA, and most of all, we have the, uh, you know, AEDB and PPIB, Private Power Infrastructure Board. All these departments, they have to see, they have to oversee. Uh, your point uh, is well taken. Uh, please give Mike Dede Aage at the front row. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, I'm Sadaf Tadat Khan, and uh, I used to work with the National Tourism <laughs> Coordination Board at the Policy Reform Group. Uh, my uh, question or suggestion to Pied is that hospitality and tourism industry is a huge industry of Pakistan, and recently UNWTO has ranked Pakistan as one of the safest tourist destinations of the world. What are Pied plans to improve the infrastructure when it comes to United Nations Sustainable Development Goals targets? I'm also the global expert on United Nations SDGs, and also... Uh, we are talking about green tourism, sustainable tourism initiatives for Pakistan. We need to hire the right consultants to implement these projects all across Pakistan, working with the relevant stakeholders from PTDC to all the tourism departments of Pakistan. Thank you. Ji, please. Um, hello. Ji, my name is Anju Masood I'm former chairperson of National Tariff Commission. Uh, I have two... Um, uh, context 
uh, the first one which was discussed about the FTA that India is enjoying better market access to China compared to Pakistan despite the FTA have been signed by Pakistan. Uh, I can witness that and I can vouch that because I signed the, um, uh, I represented Pakistan for the second round of um, uh, CPFTA, the agreement with the China when I was Joint Secretary in Ministry of Commerce. And yes, we highlighted to the Chinese um, uh, authorities that India is enjoying better market access to China compared to Pakistan because India is part of regional trade agreement, APTA, that has an access to China. That's one context. The second context is about agriculture and real estate. I wonder why it was not mentioned, and I would like to highlight the expansion of the cities and uh, the termination of the orchards, mango orchards, the kinu orchards in Multan and Sargoda, how real estate expansion is um, uh, costing the agriculture uh, expansion and how agriculturists is diverting uh, and selling the land uh, to build colonies and the small towns all around. So I, I I wish this was highlighted in the in the real estate sector uh, uh, slides and presentation. Thank you very much. The uh, it's in the report. I think the conversation this time be goes on. Yeah. Anyone else? Doctor Sail from Food Scouting. I have listened from the sport price for wheat. It is not a farmer is not bound to follow this price, but sport price is an indicative price. It is not capturing the whole cost of the sowing of the wheat. It is uh, just to secure the food security. It is impossible sometimes to take in the time and uh, availability in the international, international market when there is a shortage of wheat. So, support prices is better to some extent, both for the for food security and for, for the farmers. I will talk about this small thing. Food security is a big thing. But quite frankly, as I keep telling people, I am very food secure. My fridge is empty. My larder is empty. I'm totally food secure. Why? Because of my credit card. If you have reserves of $100 billion, we are very food secure. Forget about food security. It's all about having reserves, money. Secondly, on tourism, sorry. Let's accept it. No tourists are going to come to Pakistan, please. Let's be truthful with ourselves. Tourism is, tourism is not going to come here to keep rosas and to pray with us. We are an illiberal country. I keep telling people, I took my daughter to Swat. And in the middle of the road, she told me, let's go home. There are only men here, no women. I feel very uncomfortable. They are staring at me. So folks, you don't want your women to come out. Why should other people bring their women here? So get with the program. There's no tourism here. And secondly, uh, the other thing I forgot. So go ahead. Any more questions? Any more thoughts? I had something else that somebody asked. I'll point to that, but later. Go ahead. G. who else? I myself have a resort called the Walnut High since 1991 in Kalam Swath. And the foreign tourism has improved over the years when we talk about Buddhist tourism. I was part of the religious tourism. The Kartarpur Kartar have been opened. People don't know their Lapti festival is coming up. Uh, a lot of sex tourism has started. So there's a lot of work coming in for Pakistan when it comes to tourism. So there's a huge potential and a lot of countries are looking at the Silk Road. The location of Pakistan would play a very important role when we talk about the CPEC and the BRI countries. And all these countries are quite interested when it comes to tourism uh, projects and investment projects for Pakistan. Great advertisement, madam. Great advertisement, but I will still go to a liberal place. I will not go to a place that does not allow me, me to dress in my shorts and that does not allow me to let my daughter dress in her shorts and that does not allow me to have a drink in the evening. Sorry, period. We can have a few Sikhs come here, we can have a few Buddhists come here and we can present ourselves as great, mashallah, religious people. Sorry, no real fucks are going to come here. It's going to be the cheap tourism that's going to come here. I lived in Sri Lanka, I lived in Egypt, and I saw tourism take place. Tourism doesn't happen in a country like this. Gee, folks, anybody else? Oh, I was going to mention about real estate. Sorry, this plots versus downtown, I've already, already mentioned it. If you want a palace downtown, and if you want nobody to build near your palace, then for God's sake, plots have to go. Then the agricultural real estate has to go. Mango trees have to go. 
So allow people to big downtown, allow people to live in flats, or 250 million people have to go somewhere. They will go into those fields. G um, hmm. sir, um, I beg to differ again. G please. And this is another attempt uh, in favor of tourism by, by the second woman. I would like to example of Mariam Noor, who traveled, who signed from Karachi. I was with her the day before yesterday. She cycled from Karachi all alone by herself in 18 days and she uh, she cycled through um, and she cycled through many cities of Punjab and she was she had no escort and she was in the jogging suit and she is Iranian girl she was all alone she didn't know the language well and she reached here in Islamabad and she was all positive, all supportive. She had a plan to go to India and Nepal afterwards, but she has postponed her visit to Nepal and India and she wants to visit Pakistan. Madam, have you heard about that? She, oh, she was secure. She was not staying on. Nobody teased her. She was safe. She stayed with the families and her her just. You've proven your point. You've proven your point. Repeating it won't do anything. The point is exceptions don't prove a rule. That's an exception. You tell me. You tell me. You tell me. Do you, as a woman, feel comfortable in this? Do you? Will you take off your debut today? Kubat kare. Kuda ke baste. Let's be clear. Let's be clear. We are a country. Can you allow a tourist to come here and have a drink out there near the hills? No, you will not. We'll go the other route. Because we've killed them enough. We can't do the same thing. 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 Continue <laughs> Uh, we've talked a lot of reforms. You've been, your team has been working on reforms and a lot of people sitting here have uh, been trying to bring in reforms. And uh, we realize when we are working in reforms that there are beneficiaries of the status quo. If there is a status quo, it is there, it is stable because there are beneficiaries. And some of these beneficiaries are very, very powerful. So we talked about the pricing of land. So we talked about the DC rate. We talked about the FPR rate. So if you talk to people who deal with pricing and FPR and ask them, why don't you have realistic prices? They will tell you something that they can't tell openly. They will tell you something as an aside that whenever they want to increase uh, the FBR rate to the actual market rate, some very powerful people come and they stop them from doing it. So you talked about why the downtown cannot be commercialized, why cannot it be monetized. Again, there are some powerful people who will not allow it to happen. Uh, why do we get uh, a failed auto policy? followed by a very similar mobile phone manufacturing policy, which is not manufacturing at all, which are getting very uh, uh, very uh, big protection against tariffs for the components, which will be assembled and sold off to the local market and it's not being sold off. So I think the prime question is that when we have these really powerful people who are going to Factoring in real estate, in banking, uh, in domestic taxation. So how are we going to bring about this change? The changes, the decisions that we had on so many uh, of these slides, they are very good. But how will you get them done when there are some very, very powerful people who are there for the status quo? Thank you very much. Very good point, Mukaram sir. Mukaram sir, Milton Friedman said that someone asked I've got that video somewhere. 
कि जी हाउ कैन यू गेट द कांग्रेसमैन टू मेक द राइट चॉइसेस वी मस्ट ब्रिंग इन द राइट पीपल उसने जवाब दिया नो वी मस्ट मेक द रॉन्ग पीपल प्रॉफिट फ्रॉम द राइट पॉलिसीज तो प्रॉब्लम यही है कि हमने जैसे मैंने आपको दो एग्जांपल दिए थे नो बडी कैन टच द इस्लामिक एजेंडा बिकॉज द पीपल विल राइज अप नो बडी कैन टच द कॉलोनियल एजेंडा द प्लॉट्स एजेंडा बिकॉज द पीपल विल राइज अप we have to make a reform profitable for politicians how when we start thinking about it one question that i have asked for you i have for you and for zulfiqar kar sahab why do we have the asan karobar bill why can't we just have a regulatory guillotine ye bataiye please why can't you have a regulatory guillotine aap log 3 saal se asan karobar bill pass kar rahe hain pata nahi kab pass hoga और जब पास होगा क्या डी रेगुलेशन हो जाएगी या डी रेगुलेशन हमें कैसे मिलेगी इंडिया में मैं मोन्टेक आलू वालिया से वेबिनार किया मोन्टेक कहता है उसने एक रात में कर दिया था यह यहाँ क्यों नहीं हो सकता जी इफ यू इफ यू लुक एट दी फैक्ट्रीज एक्ट फैक्ट्रीज एक्ट वॉज पास इन द ब्रिटिश एरा नाइनटीन थर्टी एंड इन इट्स लेजिस्लेशन सीज दट एवरी फैक्ट्री मैनेजर इज गोइंग टू कीप अ रजिस्टर in which the, the, he is going to write down the names of all the workers mm-hmm. and uh, they it's going to be swept every day and it will be washed every week and this will be entered in the register so the colonial agenda that you talked about have put in place all these regulations in the laws and the bureaucracy is going to say we cannot cut it down unless and until you change the law because it is written in the law that such and such thing will be done in such and such way therefore the laws have to be changed so this asan karobar act uh, brings in an easier way of taking it out of the law normally when you want to take something out of the law you have to take a bill to the parliament and it has to be passed by both the houses in the case of federation and by the uh, provincial assembly in the case of a province with this uh, asan karobar act all you need to do is have um, some some sort of a paper written saying that all these regulations go and they will go you don't need to take it to the national assembly you don't need to take it to the senate so the reason for having this uh, asan karobar act is to have a law that will uh, will do away with the requirement of making all the legal changes go through the parliament this is why uh, they are producing a law but will it kill all L- R- L- R- L- is, is it you say it, it can uh, the uh, how it envisages is, is that a committee of businessmen and committee of experts will sit and they will just decide that these regulations in the law just need to go away and then you don't need to take it to the parliament it will just go uh, as a document to the president and it will be it will just go away but it will go law by law slowly slowly so uh, go in one go i mean i think quite frankly where we are right now we are stifled we are dying it needs to happen very fast if it takes a year or two i don't know what's going to happen either we do it in, in a month or two or we can simply say okay fine we'll live like this yeah you are you are very right like uh, in i when, when dr shamshad akhtar came in as the caretaker finance minister and she was again bent uh, on focused on deregulation because she talks about india uh, she was involved with the indian reforms when they were doing the deregulation so a meeting was called and i was one of the people who were invited there were a lot of bureaucrats and caretaker ministers also sitting in that meeting and i started talking to her about uh, this this policy that they talk about uh, which is zero regulation okay hmm. and when i talked about the zero regulation you could hear the oohs and ahs around the table yeah. and first a couple of bureaucrats said no 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 you can't do away with everything the, 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 these are very necessary things things might get terribly wrong and jaise wo qawali mein phir hamnawa unke sath milte hain then you could see people around the table including some of the caretaker ministers saying no 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 zero regulations going to be very dangerous we can't go to zero regulation so it was scuttled so you will have a lot of people trying to scuttle it and they will scuttle it with all their knowledge that they have gained over 30 40 years and they will also come up with anecdotes remember one session we were doing uh, at pied in which we talked about uh, the uh, construction related deregulation 
and somebody from the CDA had come in and he kept talking about that earthquake that we had 15 years ago. Just in the building and that was their reason building damage so we need to have all the approvals and uh, permissions and regulations and when we questioned that gentleman and we said but when that building fell then there were regulations so why did that building fall down hmm. And this person said, we, when we conducted the inquiry, we found out that somebody had bribed the overseer and they had given the license without uh, checking, checking it properly. So uh, this is the big challenge that you have, that we have really big, huge beneficiaries of this existing uh, setup and they will try the level best. So I think maybe Asan Karobar Act might give you a way of getting it through Otherwise, I feel that uh, we will be in 10 years time again, be sitting in some hall and talking about deregulation. Thank you very much. Those who talk about neoliberal agenda, ki baat karte na, they should be clear what neoliberal agenda is. We have a lot of regulation that has been made by the government. Do you know that RAP has regulated the drug sector to almost death? That insulin is not available in a country where we are the diabetes champion of the world. We have 30% diabetes compared to the nearest country, 23% diabetes. What policy do we have? We have subsidized sugar and ban insulin. This is what regulation has done. So those who want to speak on the neoliberal agenda, please tell me how do we handle this? Anybody, any neoliberal person, anti-neoliberal person want to speak about it? Don't tell me there's a neoliberal crowd. I'm surprised. Muswi sahab hai? Sari ka time ho gaya? Kaun bol raha? Koi nahi bol raha? Chalein ji kare, if sari ka time ho gaya, you want to pick up your food because you're all hungry or are you iman wala and you can wait? All the best folks. Humari last slide kaya bhi wo dikha de? Last slide nahi hai? Dikha de, dikha de quickly. To ye hai ji, if we can go in for good Quick deregulation. If you can be bold, but if you're going to do the usual thing, jo karte hai, ye sadak bana do, ye university bana do, ye kar do, jo jisko wo kehta hai, jo TV anchor kehta hai, delivery ki hai. Humne delivery ki hai. Humne kya delivery ki hai? Mari economy delivery ki hai? Ye soch ne please. Delivery ka matlab hai, hume kaam karne ka mauka dein. Opportunity dein. Ye nahi ki humara saans band kar ke chhati pe baith ke kahe, haan bhai, ab bol. Thank you. Thank you.